in the previous sessions. So welcome again, everyone. Thank you for joining this session. We hope you had a great day. Today, uh, we are going to have a, an amazing session on data with Sarah. But before going to that, I would like to remind us some of our community guidelines and some half skipping stuff just so that we start on the same foot, everyone. It's probably already a song right now, but believe me, it's worth reminding us again and again. So the call is going to be recorded and transcribed. Or you can access also the captions by clicking on the CC icon. It should be somewhere around the lower part of your Zoom screen. And the video is going to be recorded as well and made available on YouTube. So if you have some internet issues or any problem why the meeting is going on, you can always go to the YouTube recording to see what you missed or what happened. And again, you're going to have the captions are going to be checked and corrected and added to the video. Also, since we are people here from a lot of different backgrounds and countries, probably my accent might not be very clear for someone. You should, you're highly encouraged to actually turn on the captions so you can see a lifetime transcription of what we are saying, just so that you are on the same line with us. About the code of conduct, we want to encourage everyone to be very active and participate. This is a time where your project or your researches are going to have a bloom. So while the presenters are making the presentations, I really advise us to be taking some notes and to point out some areas where it's immediately related to our projects and ask questions because our experts are here and are ready to answer project or research specific questions so that our projects or research tool be achieved promptly and well. So if you also experience any unacceptable behavior during this session, it is meant to be a safe and open space for everyone. Please feel free to write us. You can check the emails in the framer part. You've already known, you're already used to it by now, or you can just send us a private message on Zoom so that we take appropriate action. Again, if you are more comfortable with uh, for the breakout room session, if you're more comfortable with uh, speaking sessions, you are encouraged to add a W. If you prefer written or written sessions, I mean written breakout rooms, you add a W to your name. Or if you prefer spoken, you can add an S beside your name. It's easy. You can go on the three dots and edit your name and just add a W. It is really helpful because when you will be assigning us to the various breakout rooms, she's going to use that to be able to group people in the spaces that they feel more comfortable or which is more convenient for them. Because you might be in a space where there's a lot of noise or you cannot speak for some reasons. And we also encourage you to open your mics. It is really interesting that as we are speaking, we can get a real-time feedback from you. That is it helps us to adjust the presentations in a way that will suit the audience best. But if you cannot do that, it's totally fine. There's no constraint to that. And without any further ado, I would like to introduce briefly our presenter of the day. She is Sarah Villa, a PhD researcher at King's College UK and one of the contributors to the Turing Way. You've probably heard about that. And she's equally mentors at the Open Seats OLS program. I would like to invite her to start with her presentation and to tell us a little more briefly about herself. Welcome, Sarah. You have the floor. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my presentation with you. Uh, okay, I think I froze. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. I think my screen just froze, of course. If I'm sorry. your computer is gonna, uh, is, if you need a minute, um, I could steal the limelight because uh, we have a short survey that I was gonna ask everyone to fill out. Please do that, Joe, because yeah, it keeps thinking. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, in that case, folks, whilst Sarah is fighting, ooh. Ooh, yeah, okay? keep talking. Yeah, yeah. keep talking. Okay, okay. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sarah is fighting her computer. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to pop a little link in the chat. We'll send this out to everyone by email as well. Um, but it is a 
five minute survey maximum. Um, and basically we're halfway through this cohort already and we are as always delighted to have you here. Um, but we know that sometimes we miss things. And so getting a little bit of feedback uh, to see what we could be doing better um, is one, one, way, one way to try and do that. Uh, so I'm actually just gonna literally pause. Um, Sarah, I'm gonna ask, just like put a timer on for five minutes. Just, uh, I can do that. Um, just while everyone actually fills it out now, if possible. Uh, so if you if you have the um, Framapad open, it's on line 55, it's the link to the survey. Um, and I've also posted it in the chat. Uh, but I am going to pause and ask everyone who's on the call to try and fill that out now, just so that we can make sure that we do get some answers. Fancy timer. <laughs> okay, hopefully my computer won't crash today. Yes. Finger crossed. Oh, man. Okay. Yes. We're here, right? Everyone's here. Perfect. I'm just going to put out the chat just in case people have questions as well. Uh, Ezra, do keep an eye as well on the chat uh, or the from a button in case I miss someone, please. I do, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be with you all. Uh, thank you for coming to today's session. My name is Sara Villa. And I will be just uh, leaving today's session about open data and fair principles. Um, I'm going to try to keep the session quite simple in terms of not complicating things. I'm hoping that you can get useful things out of it and that you can apply to your own projects. Uh, as Ezra was commenting before, I also do have an accent, of course. Uh, feel free to pause, raise your hand, uh, ask a question in the meeting chat box or in the framapad. Um, as, uh, as you mentioned, like we are here now uh, to take advantage of it. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm a researcher at King's College London, uh, where I've been um, yeah, researching chronic pain for almost seven years. I mostly do like molecular uh, studies uh, of pain. And for that, I had to teach myself a bit of bioinformatic analysis. And that's where I started digging into all the reproducibility crisis, uh, version control tools, open data, uh, first standards, and all of this that you guys are learning as well. I do keep learning about it uh, because it's such an interesting topic. And I hope that I, yeah, this is useful for you. Um, I'm also in the Slack channel. So uh, if you don't get to ask any question today for whatever reason, uh, I'm always available there as well. So uh, as I said, I want to keep things quite uh, simple. Uh, forget about the time. I mean, it's not like I'm counting minutes. Uh, I'm literally just going to start with an introduction to data and then jump in to write away to a reflection exercise. Uh, I'm hoping that for those exercises, we can uh, put uh, people together in breakout rooms so you can just talk uh, a bit with each other uh, about the questions that I will uh, mention. I guess, you know, I'm the first one like feeling shy about all these sessions and all of that. Uh, so it's really to, going to be like very simple questions. You literally just have to talk one sentence to each other if you want to. Also feel free, uh, there are like the speaking and the writing modes. Uh, you can just write in the from as well. Uh, like as, as long as you guys uh, intervene and participate, I'm just like more than happy with that, yes. And I think it will keep everything much more interesting. Then we'll just talk a bit about open data, a bit of another exercise. Uh, <clears throat> again, the, we'll talk about, discuss a bit more about barriers for open data and for data, a bit of another exercise, and then I'll get all your questions. Uh, hopefully you will have some for me <laughs> or for the rest of the team. So again, just keep it things Simple. I'm talking about data all the time. You guys, I'm sure, are talking about data all the time. What is data, really? Uh, so literally, data is any type of information, any type of information that you can collect, observe, or even create. In this case, I'm talking about the context of research, but literally, you can apply it for 
anything. So we were joking before about uh, the um, icebreaker question of what is your favorite data set. For me, even a poem could be a data set. Like it really depends on the context and uh, and yeah, what you consider data. But I just wanted to get that out there. So uh, yeah, there we go. So scientific data um, or Again, any kind of data is any type of uh, information collected. We can usually distinguish between different types. So we say like primary data when we are talking about raw measurements from uh, instruments, uh, secondary data when we have processed already uh, that data into some kind of analysis or interpretation. And then we have the published data, which is like the final format and it usually is available for use and reuse. And then the metadata, which is the data about your data. So literally, which day did you collect that data? In which format is it? Uh, in how are you going to publish? So things like that. So going back to our topic, like what is open data? When we talk about open data, what do we mean? So it's really like kind of, there are a lot of definitions going around. But I feel like even if you go uh, to like a company um, library, let's say, or even like if you go to the open data handbook, uh, like I went in here, everybody agrees that open data is just data that can be really used, that can be re reused and redistributed by anyone. Yes, so it has to really be accessible for reuse. So my first question to all of you is why? Why do we think that open data is important and why we should be using it uh, as, like, as much as possible? Um, so yeah, we are going to put you in some breakout rooms and give you just five minutes to throw out some thoughts out there. Uh, if one of the people in the room could just like, when we finish the discussion, just uh, let us know uh, afterwards, uh, like having a kind of a speaker. If not, just write them in the Pramapad and I can go through them as well. Uh, so yeah, just like five minutes of yeah, gathering thoughts about why should be using uh, open data. Do you want me to open them? Yes, please, Joe. Okay, okay. Um, I have all of the people who've indicated written in one room and two speaking rooms, and they are opening in <coughs> three, two, one, five minutes. Okay, let's pause that recording. Mm -hmm. Hello, yes. Imanda hey. Nancy. Yes. You can open your mic and speak, please. Hi. Hi. My name is Iman, and I'm working as assistant professor at Sultan Qaboos University in Sultanate of Oman. Actually, we discussed in the group about the open data, and personally, also, I am working now on a granted project of measuring the awareness of people at, the, at my university about the open data and also the the use of it and the challenges of not using or so the group actually agreed about that open data going to uh, enhance reproducibility of research and um, uh, also, people face limitation in getting data, actually. So that's what, like, Abdul Aziz mentioned about cancer data. So also making data uh, open, it will be accessible and findable for researcher. And uh, in terms also of transparency, so we get some insights and values from data and some decision made on it. So some people may, uh, like... Um, have uncertainty about certain things, so they can actually reproduce the analysis, for example, especially if the data is tidy and ready to be uh, for, for the analysis. So they can check by themselves for certain things. And um, 
also the things that I care of it, there are a lot of funded projects actually, either by the government, by universities, by whatever sports that they're going to use. So uh, make the data here open, going to, we gain benefits from it because we, we, they, they actually cost a lot. Uh, so no one knows what is the revenue or benefit from it. So knowing the cost benefit from from the data by making it open, that uh, that also I think is important. So that's from my side. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. You're so right. Uh, I, I really love some of those points. I'm just going to give it to uh, good news, Sandy, because I know they already have like very good points to share. <laughs> Oh, right. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so in my room, we had this conversation as about uh, why data should be open. And I remember, um, I think earlier I started out by saying that uh, the reason why we should have data open from the definition is that you no know, open data, having data to be open is for openness, basically for, uh, for us to have a uh, that are accessible to everyone. I think that's the right word, accessible to everyone. And with having the data accessible to everyone, everyone is able to use that data. Different organizations is able to use that data because it's out there and you can use it. So accessibility was just a summary of that. And also with accessibility, we have different perspectives to the data for solutions. So if the data is out there, if different people have access to this data, they can interpret this data in different ways, which brings about different uh, ways of solving problems. People see things in different perspectives, right? So you, someone can solve it this way because we have the same data, someone can interpret it differently. So that means about having perspectives on different solutions that you know, that we can be used to solve a problem. So it brings about different uh, perspectives to solutions to problem. And collaboration was the last one. I was mentioned, which was really interesting. Like, yeah, because it actually really aids collaboration. Like when we have the data out there, it aids for people to come in and be able to collaborate to use this data for a greater impact. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. Those are excellent points. I am just going to yeah enforce a bit more your data, your point about everybody can access it. So not only you can collaborate on the data, but I really love the point on the perspectives, the different context. The same that data can be viewed so differently by a person in the case, I'm going to talk about research, uh, for example, from my perspective, from a person that just works in neuroscience, that from a person who works in medicine or from a person who works in social sciences and the same data can give so much other data out uh, if the different eyes are seeing it. So yeah, I, I really love that point. Uh, Edmund Clark has uh, the hand raised, yes? Yes, uh, thank you for giving the floor and uh, hello everyone. So um, in my side, I'd like to say that uh, Open Data uh, can help uh, the researcher in uh, developing country as uh, Madagascar because uh, it is very difficult uh, for us because uh, I'm a researcher in the uh, environment uh, sector. And uh, personally, to be honest, I, uh, I think that uh, it is still difficult for me to access uh, several data. So, uh, talking of, for example, uh, about uh, network access in Madagascar, my country, uh, I have sometimes a problem about uh, how to to get uh, internet. Uh, even uh, if I have internet, it is uh, very very difficult for me to. Even uh, if there is uh, open data, uh, my main problem is about internet. Okay. And uh, maybe uh, this open data can help me to to access uh, the several data in the 
all. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your totally. Yeah, I guess, uh, of course, like the easier you can get some data because it's already made open and you don't have to request access and you don't have to be fighting with 10 different websites to actually get the data downloaded and use it and things like that. It will be better uh, if you also like have yeah network problems uh, and energy uh, difficulty access. So yes, you, you do have a super strong point as well. Okay, so we are going to move on. Uh, the question is also there in the Framapath. Feel free to also drop there your answers if you want to revisit later. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for participating, everyone. I'm going to share again my screen. Okay, so then we can move on to what I thought uh, and I'm going to be quite uh, fast through this because you guys already did an amazing work and mentioned all of this. Uh, so why uh, using open data? So for example, when talking about science, uh, reproducibility is a huge uh, reason. 50%, up to 50% of the scientific resources uh, used in other articles are actually uh, non-identifical. Uh, also, 70% of researchers have said that they tried and failed to reproduce other published uh, experiments. Uh, tons of millions of dollars are actually uh, being dedicated to reproducibility in the sciences. So as uh, someone else mentioned, um, since we are ma since making this data is costing money, let's make the most out of it. Um, so literally, again, just going super fast through this because you guys already <laughs> mentioned it. Um, so open data does help to make science more reproducible and accessible, uh, makes grant money being less wasted. And also it can give you, I think you nobody know, mentioned it, but of course, when you make your, your, open, your data open, uh, it can also give you a career boost because uh, you don't actually need a paper. You can just like actually cite your own data. So there are some... Um, platforms like Zenodo or OSF that actually give you a DOI every time you deposit whatever type uh, of data. So that's also very nice. Uh, from the perspective, for example, of communities on events, I really came across uh, about this. It's literally just like a, a organization that wants to uh, promote uh, sports events in London. So like as random as that. And they were still like uh, advocating for open data, which I found uh, quite refreshing because they said like, oh, it can really improve the user's experience. It can create uh, innovation in the sector and also benefit like the activity providers, like reuse the events and things like that. And uh, just to finish uh, again, so from the public and policy sector perspectives, uh, this is just taken from the open data soft web. Um, again, just the same that you guys have mentioned, transparency is much better. It drives actually innovation and growth uh, from the different reasons that we have already agreed on. Uh, it usually helps with better management of policies and in generally benefits the culture and the environment. Um, so yeah, so now let's say, let's see, how do we actually make our data open? So this is just a table that I really like, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, from this website. And I just want to think yourselves uh, about the data that you work with and that you manage and how many stars are you going to give yourself? So you get one star if you actually make your stuff available on the web under an open license. So we will talk about license a bit more uh, later, just briefly. Uh, but if you are already making your stuff available on the web under an open license, you get one star. So uh, if you make your stuff available, but also as a st structured data, so meaning, for example, you are uploading an Excel instead of just an image scan or a table of the table, um, you get two stars. If you actually use open formats. So again, coming back to the table example, you use a CSV format instead of Excel, which is uh, which people have to pay for it. Uh, you get three stars then. And uh, if you use like URIs to denote things, so people can actually find your stuff easier when we're talking about links, you can get four stars. 
And if you link your data to other data to provide context, so either references or the, the databases, things like that, you get five stars, yes? So I'm going to give you half a minute, guys, to think about it and share in the from about how many stars do you get in uh, your actual data sets or the data that you work with. There's no shaming. Uh, when I started working, I wasn't even getting one star. And I think I'm barely in the three star layer now. So uh, we all work with the tools that we can uh, and that are available to us. So I just wanted to make you think about, make you guys think about how we can actually improve ourselves because as everything in life, this is just a process. So if you can share those in the Framapad, that would be amazing. Just let me know how many stars do we have and we can make a, an overall countdown at the end of the session. Um, so then another exercise time. Uh, now I, I want you to think individually because this will be, I think, very personal depending on people's experiences. So why, if we have already discussed and agreed about how good, how amazing it is to work with open data and all the reasons behind it, why aren't we doing it? So why are uh, policy sectors don't do it, aren't doing it? Why are researchers, some researchers not doing it? Why people in general are not doing it? Why, again, no shame. Sometimes it's just as easy as not having network enough to upload a uh, hundred terabytes of data. Sometimes it's just not knowing how to do it. So I would really like you to think the barriers that you think there are to uh, use open data and just uh, write your thoughts in the Framapad. If you can't, uh, we can uh, give you five minutes for this, if that's okay, and then we can uh, continue with the rest of the session. Two before access, and case two, some research can be accessed for free. Uh, is the data in both of these cases referred to as open data? As Benton has already, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names, I'm doing the best I can. Please feel free to correct me. I am a fast learner. Uh, so I do totally agree with Benton. Uh, case one, I would say if the subscription, for example, maybe this is not the, actually the truth, but I would say if the subscription, um, requires you for you to pay, then definitely no, it's not open data because open data has to be freely accessible. If it might be one of these cases that you just subscribe to a newsletter or things like that, I don't know if people are still doing that, maybe that might still be open because you just have to uh, subscribe, but I guess it wouldn't be, it would be border, borderline ethical, let's say. Um, and definitely if some research can be accessed for free, then yes, it qualified to be uh, open data. Uh, thanks a lot for your thoughts and for the question. And question for Patrick, how do we ensure or verify data quality? This is actually, I love this question because this is actually a tricky one. <laughs> um, so I would say, Probably the answer is not going to be very useful, but I would say it really depends on the field. So some fields have very uh, have done a very good job in uh, putting together and in place some standards to actually measure the quality and uh, and some guidance to say this is the metadata that you have to include when you upload your data. Uh, this is the type of uh, yeah format that you have to follow. This is the Basically, they guide you how to do it properly. So it is an, a proper quality, let's say. Some other fields, I would say, they are still quite behind that. Uh, and as some person, uh, let me know, I don't know if you put the name, but I already said, I already read uh, in your insights that uh, actually uh, incomplete or inaccurate data can undermine its value. So I totally refer to this. Um, even if you publish out there your data, but it is incomplete or not with not the correct metadata, uh, then you know it's, it's just a waste. Uh, people won't be able to reuse it, basically, uh, which is again part of the definition of uh, open data. But uh, yeah, and then people have their own quality standards, let's say. So that's what I mean. I would 
I think it is really nice when certain fields have their own standards and the community has agreed to these standards uh, and they are embodied. But it is true that uh, not every field uh, has this standard. So in case, for example, talking by experience in the sequencing community, if you go to neuroscience, we are still working through those standards. Uh, so yeah. <clears throat> and then, yeah, so Benton is saying here, if the, Benton, if the data is verifiable, then you can ensure data quality. Uh, but yeah, I, I am going just to go through some of your insights about the barriers. Uh, so going back again, so if it is incomplete or inaccurate, uh, it just won't be useful enough. Uh, some A lot of people are mentioning the data format. Um, Privacy, that's a very good one. Uh, of course, uh, if it is private data or healthcare data, there are ways to share it in some kind of format. So sometimes you cannot uh, share the raw format or you can, but you can unidentify uh, the sources, uh, but you can always share, for example, the process format. So we, when we talk about open data, remember that we can be talking about primary data, but also secondary process data. Uh, so in private uh, and ethical issues, uh, we can always rely on that. And then I do also agree a bit, a bit, no, a bit much with Abdul, uh, uh, who's mentioning that it's more about mindset and training. That is not all, because again, uh, there are a lot of things that are, uh, that the communities are still learning, but I think that is a very good point. Sometimes we just don't know how to do it. As I mentioned, like me, some years ago, I, I didn't even know how to upload data. So um, that's going to make very difficult for me to share it. So yeah, I agree. Like you guys are already in uh, in a very good place because you are already being part of a very good training. Uh, so you will be able uh, to go with open data uh, with your projects now. So just, yeah, this was uh, part of uh, my own ideas. But again, um, you guys already mentioned that. So, uh, some of them have solutions, some of them don't have them. So it does require a bit of extra work uh, because you have to record more or be careful that you're yeah, following certain standards or uh, saving extra metadata. But again, it's sometimes it's just as, as useful as use, as, as easy as use just available tools and plan beforehand. And then the extra work won't be extra work uh, when thinking in the future. Sometimes you just have have to manage choices. Uh, how do I upload it or not? The privacy barrier that you guys have already mentioned. And then uh, in the field of research specifically, there's this publication bias, uh, which is that negative data usually is not uh, easily um, publicable, let's say. So people don't bother to make it open because it's not going to be citable. Uh, I think the field is changing towards uh, the gears, but, but we are still having a bias around that. Um, let me monitor in the data for uh, if I put, pay for the subscription. Yeah, what may what Joe just said, like, so it has to be accessible for everybody, like the data uh, to be considered open data. Uh, it is possible to access data without internet connection. If so, can we say open data? That is actually a very good point. Ah, you guys are making me think a lot. I love it. Um, yeah, I guess when thinking about data, we always think about digital data. You're totally right. Let's say, well, to be honest, no, no. So as long as you can go to a library and access the data, I would say it is open, isn't it? It's just that you don't have to make the trip. Um, but yeah, as I said, as long as you don't have to pay, for example, for a library membership, a, a book is still data and it will be open if you can access it. Um, but I'm open. Yes, Joe. Yeah. So I'm very excited. Um, uh, so I was actually at an open science conference a couple of months ago, and I'm trying to remember what the name of this project was, but it was a Latin American project. Uh, for open community data in areas with no internet and they used baobab seeds which are really really big I didn't know this I saw one for the first time but they took baobab seeds uh, or maybe fruit and they put um, like raspberry pies so small portable devices in and they had these devices that you could take around anywhere run it on the battery and project 
uh, a mobile internet. It wasn't connected to the rest of the internet, but it had a lot of information on it. Um, so it's a form of what was called what what sometimes is called sneaker net, which is when you physically transfer data from one location to another. So I think open data doesn't require internet, but sometimes now that we've gotten used to the internet, <laughs> figuring out how to do it sounds more ingenuous than um, it would have 20 years ago, where I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't have internet anyway, so of course this is what open is. <laughs> I just, I was so excited I had to share that. <laughs> no, no, that's how, I, I mean, I, I, it was just blowing my mind as soon as you were saying it, like, I cannot imagine, like, the, yeah, the, the tool inside the seed, and yeah, it sounds amazing. Thanks for sharing. Um, okay, so we are going to get back. Uh, so basically we've covered open data till now. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are going now to make the point. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I wanted to make the point actually about open data. Yes, and private data. As you have already mentioned, uh, several of you in the insights in the Pramapad. So private data, I think it's another chapter. So of course that goes above anything. Uh, people do deserve their dignity, their agency, their privacy rights to be uh, uh, respected. And we always work with confirmed consent. Uh, this said, uh, usually how people handle private data it should be like anonymized. Uh, as I said, like maybe you don't have to share the raw data, but you can share the process one. Uh, but ultimately, this is private data and uh, it is up to the people. Um, so I think this is another uh, chapter in here. There are ways of making this type of data open or fair. We will discuss this uh, in a bit. Um, so it's not, oh, because I work with patient data, let's say, I'm not going to make it open. There are ways of making some parts of the data open. So let's not forget that. But of course, it does have special circumstances and special things to consider. So then I wanted to move on to fair principles because when people talk about open data, they usually talk it, uh, talk very, or they swap their definition with the fair data, which is following these fair principles. And it is, uh, it, do, it does have a relation, but it's not the same. So I want uh, to walk you through all of these. So basically, fair is, uh, as it says here, so it's like a, um, a group of principles. So it is not a standard. Fair stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And as I said, like it is a set of principles. So it is not rules. It is not a standard. It is more like an open science process ambition. I really like this uh, mindset. And basically it defines the best practices for data and software in order to, to improve the discovery and the growth uh, and the reuse by humans and machines as well and computers. So as I mentioned, FAIR does stand for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. I'm going just to go through all of these uh, now. Uh, so I forgot to say in the beginning, this presentation will be available for you guys. So I'm just going to go a bit pass through this uh, very um, charged slides, let's say, like they don't have a lot of content. Not all of it is essential, but they will be all available for you, yes. I'll share the link from the Zenodo uh, lately, later. So <clears throat> when talking about uh, findable, it's just as simple as you can, your data can be discovered by others. So uh, why? Because we want to reuse it. So uh, for that, the data and the results, uh, you have to assign them like a persistent identifier that is usually called a DOI, a digital object identifier, for example, in the case of data code or publications. Um, it has to have very clear metadata, um, including yeah, the identifier of the data that it describes. And uh, the data and the results, for example, are registered or indexed in a searchable resource. So if there are like science people here, you might have heard about PubMed, for example. So that is the web that everything related to medicine uh, uses, but like there are other ones around there. Um, when talking about identif accessible, uh, again, it's just as simple as your data can be made available to others. Uh, how do you do that? So you can retrieve your data just as uh, easily as clicking that uh, identifier. The protocol is open, free, and implementable. 
<clears throat> excuse me. So again, like uh, it is just talking into an internet, uh, like talking around an internet area again. So how can we do that? Just like following like an FTP, putting it out there uh, in a website, uh, things like that. And then uh, when talking about interoperability, uh, we are talking, I guess this is the part that me as a researcher, I struggle the most, which is like that your data can be integrated with other data because that already requires a bit more techie side depending on the type of data. So you normally have to use a standardized data format. Um, it has to be, yeah, like um, usually or before, at least years ago, it used to need to be written in English. And now I think things are changing a bit for the best. Um, but yeah, you normally also like have to include uh, qualified references to other metadata. Uh, so here, again, you can just use Zenodo uh, uh, or other uh, websites to actually uh, try to make all of this work. And then uh, reusable, which is the last one, again, it speaks for itself. So it just means your data can be used, reused by others. Uh, how? so that the data actually has a very nice metadata associated uh, with a detailed provenance. So where is it coming from? Uh, it is uh, richly described. And the most important thing is that this data is released with a clear and accessible data usage language license. So you are going to hear more about licenses in the next cohort call, but I just wanted to make the point that if you don't mention the license that you are using when depositing your data, it is not accessible, yes? So you might think, oh, I'm not making a point about what the license uh, is there for this. So everybody can use it, no. So if you want really for everybody uh, to use it, you just put an open license uh, attached to your data, but you actually have to make that happen. Otherwise, people cannot reuse it. Yes, so it won't be accessible. So this is very important for you to understand. Um, and then coming back to the comparison from open data to uh, fair data, uh, and talking again uh, yeah, about the uh, private data and all of that. So again, fair data doesn't mean open data, and open data doesn't mean fair data. So the both are the best thing that you could do. Like your data set is both open and fair. So I'm making this point because I would say if you had to choose, hmm, if I had to choose, I would probably choose fair. Why? Because closed data can still be fair. So again, uh, if you are talking about private uh, data where you cannot really uh, share to everyone, but you can share within a, a specific community, let's say doctors, in studying a cohort of patients or something like that. But if, so that data is not accessible for all the world to use, it is just accessible for a hospital, but it is actually deposited in a fair uh, way. So like everybody within the hospital can reuse it, can find it, can access it, can use it within their own data sets. Um, so that is closed data, but it can be fair. So this is more useful than actually having open data that is not fair. So going back to actually some of your thoughts before, you can have open data, but it's not properly documented or it's in unscrapable repositories. So it cannot really be useful or it cannot really be reused. So um, again, like open data is not that it's bad, uh, but if you can make your open data fair so people can actually reuse it. So again, this was coming back to one of your examples about um, incomplete data. If the date, if imagine, I've had that, um, again, coming from my personal experience, I've had that uh, example of, I liked the paper that was being published. I tried to retrieve the sad data set. I actually could delete, uh, could download the data set, but the samples were mismatched and the sample names weren't properly documented. So literally I didn't know what was what. I didn't know what was apples, what was pears. So it didn't really matter that the data was open because it wasn't done in a fair way. Um, so this is what I mean. Like, uh, of course, in the ideal world, we, will, we want both open, like data to be open and fair, but we also need to work with what we have. 
Also, I wanted to highlight uh, this motto. Uh, I don't even, I don't, I should realize where I got it from, uh, but I really like the first data motto, which is like, you make your data as open as, possi as possible and as closed as necessary. So this is again, applying to all this private and ethical data um, that sometimes people work with. Sometimes you just cannot make it open and that's also fine. As long as you make it as open as possible and as close as necessary, that would be fantastic. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we apply FAIR principles? So I'm just going to give you a spoiler alert, uh, but you will work on this in your next cohort call. So basically you will be, uh, if you use data management plans or DMPs, uh, as experts say, uh, or lazy people talking like me. Uh, so basically it will make everything easier uh, to work with open and fair data. So this is, I really like this, like my computer crashed or I lost all my data. Well, it's, it is a good thing that before starting collecting this data, I had a data management plan in, pro, in uh, like thought and all the data is already backed up and it's referred to here and it's referred to that. So like usually a lot of the problems and a lot of the barriers uh, that we've discussed before, uh, they are they have nice and easy solutions if you work with data management plans. Uh, as I said, you will work on this your your next cohort call. So make sure that you don't mix, you don't miss that, or that you touch with it. And just to finish the session, uh, one last exercise. Yes. Uh, so we're going to put you again in breakout rooms just because I wanted you to discuss. So maybe you already know uh, examples when data is not fair and how can it be? So sometimes it's just company policies or, or as I said, data availability, things like that. But yeah, if you guys can just uh, discuss in the breakout rooms. So if you can think of any examples when data is not fair and if you can actually fix it uh, and how, so that will give you extra point for those stars that we were collecting. Um, so yeah, we can discuss it all together later as we've done before. But yeah, so the question would be examples when data is not fair or that you've encountered, why couldn't you make your data fair? And how could you fix it if it can be fixed? Um, so yeah, if you can guys uh, join the breakout rooms um, or uh, write it in the framapad, feel free, uh, either way is fine. Thanks. How long do you want? Uh, maybe just five minutes because we are already yeah. running. Oh yeah, yeah. If I, if I, okay. The opening, <laughs> folks. You have five. It's the last one, so yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think everyone is back uh, to the main room. So just as before, if you could, uh, anyone can share what you guys have been uh, discussing, any examples that you have come up with uh, where data is not fair and how could you fix it? Uh, just unmute yourselves or raise your hands. Uh, we would love to hear your thoughts. Yes, Alan, go ahead. Hello everyone, once again. Uh, so I think, if if the data doesn't have sufficient metadata, uh, let's say you don't know where we don't know the source. I think it becomes uh, not fair, and uh, I think the person that is responsible for that data should include sufficient metadata. And uh, I don't know if there are cases where someone where some countries, where some people in certain countries can access the data and some other people in other countries can't access the data. So if there are such cases, I think uh, the data is not fair and the, it needs to be open to the rest of the world. Yeah, thank you so much. I have a follow-up reflection slash question on that. I've seen a scenario where data was restricted so that, I think it was India, the, the data could not legally be held outside of Indian service 
in order to protect data sovereignty because of a history of global north misuse. I'm curious how you'd feel about that. Wow, you've uh, left me speechless. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, I guess we could say, yeah, uh, data is the next war, like war coming up, isn't it? I don't feel, I don't think, yeah, I guess. So this would mean that uh, if they don't allow the data to be in other countries' servers, but it, they won't allow other countries to use it no that's what you meant as well potentially yeah i think i'd have to investigate a bit more but i do know that it meant that people couldn't you know go to amazon um or whatever server it might have been that they would have expected because the country needed yeah. to retain control over the data i mean again i would say that maybe that data it is indeed fair but it is definitely not open um but it might be fair if it followed the right standards. Uh, so yeah, it really depends. Coming on this different countries thing, I actually did experience that last week. I wanted to to access the data sets from a specific uh, published paper on uh, arthritis. And it was like patients' uh, data and that was properly like stored. But it's, it was stored in a United States specific server and database and it made basically impossible for anyone outside the state to access even the process data. So that was also like very annoying and a very example of not fair data. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Iman, yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Just uh, what I noticed also though, when we search about open data, it is more governmental data rather than research data. So I don't know about the other countries, but uh, at least for UK, I know because I studied there. So they have better open data compared to my country. But here they still say, okay, fine with me about the concept of governmental data, but it is so statistics and tabulated data where I cannot reuse it to actually, uh, to, 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 to conduct a research or something. It is very limited. And they always have like a box. If I would like to, although they're the website, like it is open, they call it. But on that, uh, they give us like an option to request data. So for me, like um, how it is open and also you give me a request. So that's not accessible. So <laughs> I don't know if yeah. I... Yeah. But that's really what uh, I, I uh, so for me, I call it more documentation rather than uh, research data, because I, call, I care more about research data or the data that can be uh, used by scientists or by researcher or uh, um, ca can actually add more insights and values. Also, when it comes to the national survey data, it is very huge data and also sensitive because it, in, it includes data related to individuals and uh, their uh, socioeconomic and things. So they're going to process it somehow. So I like in UK, they use micro sampling where they actually still, I can get a huge and large set data for analysis, but at the same time, I'm keeping the privacy of individuals. So that's how they should be fixed but yeah that's where for me it is like okay fair but it is not i have to request in order to get more so that's not accessible so that's my my main concern here <laughs> yeah thank you thank you so much for sharing yeah i do i do feel so identify about what you said like there's nothing more scary than yes yeah, seeing a paper or a data set that says available upon request and it's like <laughs> If you have to request it, then it's not open, as you rightfully said already. So yeah, it is a very annoying situation. Yes. Anyone else wants to share any other examples or any other thoughts about open and fair data? This is our, well, we have a Q and A later, but yeah, last discussion, let's say. Is that it? Okay. So if that's it till now, I will, I am still screen sharing, I don't know, yes. 
So I will just move to the last slide, which again has a lot of material. Uh, I'm sharing these slides, uh, so I'm just going to go over it uh, a bit quick. Uh, so again, how to be fair. So just a bit of summary, there's tons of things uh, around. Uh, I would say my highlight points would be deposit your data where others can find it, <clears throat> make your data and metadata accessible. Do create that metadata, of course, as simple as that. Sometimes the data doesn't even have metadata, so that's uh, a bit difficult to reuse. Uh, don't forget to include information on ownership and provenance, so where does it come from? I'm going to keep, again, an insistent hand on use a clear license. If you don't allow, uh, outline your, your license, then it's not reusable, yes? So if you want everyone to reuse your data, then just put a Creative Commons or a, uh, an open license, but no license means that there won't be access. And then uh, again, just uh, as the earlier that you start doing these kind of things, the better. Uh, it does take a time uh, like to get used to work in certain ways. It is a bit of a learning curve. Uh, and I feel like it will be a forever learning curve because there's always new tools, new ways of doing things. But the, the sooner that you start learning basics, uh, I think it gets earlier and it pays step forward. Definitely always pays forward. So yeah, I would encourage you to uh, think about how to make your data a bit more open, a bit more fair whenever possible. Um, these are my favorite resources. I reused the slides from a lot of previous OLS experts already out there. Uh, OLS has a wonderful library out there. These are some of the other resources that you can use on fair data. Uh, I really love, as I said, like the Open Seeds Library, the Turing Way, uh, on Open Data, you have the Open Knowledge Foundation. So there's like tons of resources out there. Uh, and I will make these uh, slides available on Zenodo. I will post the link uh, later on. So you have a summary of everything. Um, with that, that's uh, that's me. Uh, I'm happy to take any further questions or doubts. And if not, as I said, I'm available either in Slack or email. Uh, just ping me when needed. Thank okay, you so thank much. you so much. Thank you to Sarah. This was a really thought provoking session. We have one last one last question from Aminu. Let me repeat the question. Can you see it? Oh, this is a direct message. Okay. Could you please answer this last question from Aminu and then we Call this session off, please. Yes. At what point of our research do we make up data open? Ha, huh, that's a very good question. So uh, again, depends. I would literally say as soon as possible. Yes, but it really depends. Again, we don't work, live in an idea world. Like people still think there's competition out there. Sometimes founders don't allow to open your data as soon as you are collecting it. So like, let's say, as soon as you can, uh, if you can just work on at least making it fair. So then once you decide to open it, it has already all the metadata, all the formatting on all of that things. Um, in research, for example, in the life sciences research, which is what I'm more familiar with, we do have a specific uh, way of working with reproducibility and open data, which is uh, registering your your registering reports, we call it. And is that you register the experiment, let's say, or the review that you want to collect. So you already uh, publish what you want to do, your goals uh, and the measurements that you're going to take, the standards that you are going to follow, the statistics that you are going to apply, all of that. Uh, and you register it already, it goes through peer review. So people already think, oh, you know, you should be doing this analysis. No, you should be doing that, things like that. And then after pre-registration, uh, so that just, you you make open, let's say the, the, the aim and the goal of the experiments or the project. And then just when you finish, you make the data uh, open and available. It really depends on the type. So this is most known in yeah, in medicine, for example, and life sciences. Uh, I guess it depends on the on the um, field. Uh, Edmond, do you do have a raised hand? You want to comment? Yeah, just so. one question, quickly. Uh, just one question. 
Okay, go on. So, uh, is there uh, any tools to to help us to verify is uh, if uh, a data is not fair? I guess uh, not really tools, but uh, you just need to check for yourself. So, like, can I find it? Does it have my data associated? Um, does it have a format that I can do, reuse with my software or with other data sets? So I guess those are, as I said, like FAIR is more a standard, like a set of principles. It's not really a, a standard uh, per se. So I don't think there's any tool, but uh, yeah, I don't know if Joe or Strust, you know, any other thing that I may be missing. Okay, let me check okay. on the frame part. Well, I think uh, this... it's just looking. I think you were asking, um, you were prompting Sarah for the um, fair tools. There are some automated assessors out there where you like paste the URL of a data set and it says, this is how fair it is. Okay. Um, unless anything has changed, they're not very good. Because like Sarah said, there's so much variation. It's more like principles that the moment you get an automated assessment, it, it doesn't necessarily know all of the, the specific nuances. Sorry, Estras. It's fine. That was insightful. All right. The presentation is going to be shared, um, Sarah. Yes, yeah. it will be. I'll just upload it. I just wanted to see if I like to keep it till the end to see if there I have to make any amends or extra comments. Uh, but yeah, I will upload it in a sec uh, in Senodo and we'll share the link uh, with you guys in Slack. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We are just about to end the session. This was really thought provoking and insightful. I'd like to congratulate each and every one of us for our interactions. This was really, really, really great session in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'd like to give some reminders before calling off the session. Firstly, if any of you have not yet filled uh, the form about your experience with the session so far, please do well to click on the link. Even after the session, you can take some time and fill it. I'd also like to remind us of our next session, which will be on the 7th of November on data management plans. And if you have any other questions for Sarah, you can free, you can freely ask it on the Slack. I think she will answer. You can also send her an email. I will, I will. <laughs> yeah, and the presentation will be available. Feel free to reach out to us if there's any other thing. Uh, thank you, Yo, for hosting this session. Thank you, Sarah, for the amazing presentation. And thank you, everyone. And see you on November 7th for the session on data management plans. Thank you, everyone. It was amazing to see you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. You're all beautiful. Everyone. Bye, Goodbye. All. Goodbye. So Bye. I appreciate if you can just say goodbye before going. I like that. If you can. If you can open your mic, feel free. Goodbye, Goodbye. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you to you, too. Thank you, Henry.